Um, so it's great to be here again at the podium, the, excuse me, the lectern this morning. Um, and the title for the talk, Our Future is What We Make It, was selected both with a nod to our teens, since they are very much in that mode right now, and also in recognition that we each have a role to play in creating the West community and the world that we desire. So some of you will remember, and other, but others may not even know, that I was once on the West staff back in 1997 to 2001, so in the olden days. But I think that gives me something of a unique vantage point, which I decided I would like to share with you all this morning. Um, and that specific experience has surfaced a few times in the last few months as Newer members um, have wondered about how things used to be, as there's been a lot of, we've had a lot of angst, rightly so, around our ability to pay our staff and what that means um, for what all we'll be having going forward as we go forward. So what I would like to tell you briefly about this morning is Wes's patterns of staffing and volunteerism, um, speak a little bit about the reality of our resources and the implications, and envision the West that we might create together. So Wes has had little staff, more staff, and now less staff. Um, and for years, like decades, Wes had a senior leader and maybe no other staff or some part-time help. But during the 1970s and 80s, during Don Montagna's leadership, Wes grew to have an extraordinary array of programs, much more than would be expected given a small staff and the size of our congregation. There was an incredibly vibrant adult education program that nearly every member participated in. People would talk about working incidents on the awareness wheel and things like that. There was a common language. It's kind of like back in the day when there were three television channels and everybody watched the same things and knew what was going on. There was a bit of that mode because everyone really did participate pretty extensively in the same kinds of activities. Um, I was hired as the second sort of full-time staffer in June 1997, and the role as it was construed then, because staff roles have changed based on needs and talents, um, I was hired as Director of Administration and Adult Education. And over the four years that I worked here, the staff grew, increasing the part-time roles of Mary Herman into being full-time community coordinator and then ultimately a certified leader, and Peggy Gates, who is here today, <laughs> as director of Sunday School and teen programs, and then took on international work, et cetera. So we grew um, because the demands of the program required it. There was a lot of complexity um, to what was going on, and things were advantaged by having you know, some people who could provide some consistency and some easy coordination and communication to support all of that work. Our Sunday school grew so large that we had to turn families away for lack of space. And eventually we went to two platforms to accommodate all the kids. We created a coming of age program out of the tragedy of a teen member's death. And we launched the International Partners Program to build solidarity with people in El Salvador. Now, through all this, we used to depend on stay-at-home parents, in particular, for a lot of that effort. But as times changed and there were fewer people who had the ability to volunteer at that number of hours, um, members shifted more into what I would call a fee-for-service mindset, right? So willing to pay for work that they didn't have time to do themselves. And over time, that culture of being served has persisted, but the fee-paying part has not kept pace. So we can't go back to either model of counting on people who have overly busy lives, including children who also have overly busy lives, right? So the patterns of participation have become quite different. Um, but we also have to recognize that we have some constraints in our resource pool. So what do we do? So Wes has certainly depended on the creativity, enthusiasm, and effort of volunteers to make things happen throughout our history. But things ebb and flow over time, depending on the interests and the energy of members. 
So I want to share a few examples of some things that have happened in the past um, and kind of what how they moved on. So I have a visual aid. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll come to this one in a moment. I'm going to just prop it. Sorry. It's not Easily see, not easily seen by just everyone. You can take a look at it after the fact. Um, one of the major things that um, lasted here for a decade from the sort of mid 80s to the mid 90s was the Helping Hands Craft Fair. And that um, emerged at a time when um, the homelessness crisis in DC was quite acute. Not that it's not still an acute problem, but it's much less in the public eye these days. But it was it was an, literally an all hands on deck kind of thing. There were just about every member of the congregation participated in this. It was a big craft sale at the beginning of December, but it was a really a year long production to solicit the crafts and price things and plan for the event and promote it. And people came from all across the city. Lots of people in West now own jewelry and artwork and things that were purchased at the Helping Hands craft sale. I actually miss it as a great gift getting space. Um, but it really was, again, back to that three television channel kind of thing. Every member of the congregation really pretty much participated in that work. Um, and so it was fairly mono-focused social justice work at the time. There were certainly other things that went on at a small scale, but that was really the singular big social justice pro program that we did. And then over time, you know, people, it, it's novelty wore off, people got tired of doing the work, the public focus shifted away from homelessness, and so eventually um, it, the, the program ended. Um, Levi mentioned we used to have make amazing puppets for our festivals, um, it was particularly for winter festival, but also spring festival. Um, there was a children's dance ensemble. Members painted these, this backdrop and things like that. So the, the, the seasonal festivals were quite elaborate. We made a small child fly one year. Um, with great trepidation, but it was a beautiful thing to behold when it happened. Um, and there was a very big cohort of kids that were involved and intergenerationally, Joe London was very involved in it one year back in the days when there were lots of small children working on it. Jeff participated in later years. We've had all kinds of folks participate in, in this really great flourishing of artistic expression. West, including great opportunities for people who didn't really think that they were particularly artistic or talented as performers, and they were amazing. So we've had that pattern. COVID certainly put the kibosh on that, um, but you know, I would encourage that there are opportunities like that going forward that we could re recreate. I mentioned international partners earlier. Um, it actually grew to the point where it sort of spun itself off and became an independent entity. And then West created Global Connections, which took over some of that work, but focused specifically on our partner relationship in El Salvador. Um, and it too has, for you know, many, um, delegations of adults and teens that have gone and had life-changing experiences. Um, but it is also facing some challenges right now in terms of whether there are people that are interested and available to make that trek to El Salvador and maintain that relationship. And so it's going through kind of a rethinking process to determine what might be its next appropriate step. And then next wave, which is the example that I have the visual aid for. So when I came here in 1993, three, four, um, first, first command, I was almost a decade younger than the next nearest youngest person probably at the time, and um, which was okay, um, but it, it was a little lonely to be <laughs> um, in a different life phase than many of the other members. And eventually a few others came and um, we, we kind of out of solidarity created a cohort called Next Wave. And at the time, mostly, I, I think I was, one of the few married people in the group and John with John. Um, it was mostly single people, but over time, you know, I would say, for example, the event, um, there's a picture on here that is literally the day that John Kennedy and Abby Davis began what is now the Dakins. Right. So um, there were other, you know, the the Kaufmans, the Schofield Lakers, the Weinfeld Patels group, you know, folks that have um, other folks that were participated and have, you know, moved on to other things. And we were an age cohort. 
um, which caused some consternation at the time. Um, but yeah, you know, we're not, we're no longer the young adult group anymore, right? Like we moved through all those phases over the last 20 years. These photos are from 2002. Um, and, um, and that's okay, right? Because people grow and we go through different phases of life and um, we still have friendships and relationships that persist, but our mode of engaging has changed over time. So again, it's okay for things to evolve to fall away. The question is, what does that space make possible for new things to emerge? We used to have a very do-it-yourself culture here at WES. Um, it was literally like, if you could imagine it, go do. That was, that was the, the, the kind of dictum, just go make it happen. It was really a very much manifestation of the reality producing function of the mind. Um, and lots of amazing things happened and some things tried and didn't stick and didn't work and that was okay. But over time, again, with somewhat less availability for volunteerism and with a growing sort of sense of thinking about like integration and of, of effort and quality control and things like that, things became a little bit more consolidated under the role of staff. And now <laughs> that doesn't work so well because we can't ask our staff to do all the things that we say we want to have happen under the amount of resources, the number of hours that we pay them to do the work. And let me tell you, having been a staff member, there's really no amount of pay that really compensates the staff for the amount of the number of hours they do, let alone the very deep emotional labor that is working for a religious community, particularly a community like Wes, where there are lots of expectations that are pretty varied <laughs> and um, where we are not shy about expressing ourselves. So we really do then think, have to rethink things. So we are faced with declining rentals and pledge revenue. And so now we need to think about how to live within our means. Now, as people of privilege, most of us don't have a whole lot of practice with this. We're used to be able to having both, not either this or that. So there's some um, practical and spiritual growth that we need to exercise here in terms of learning how to prioritize um, what we want. Now, there are two ways that we can approach this. We can either right-size our expectations, or we could grow the pool of resources by pledging more and by doing more ourselves and really returning to an ethos of Wes as a co-created, self-directed congregation. So that actually could be a both approach, right? That is a place where we could have both. We could have both right-sizing expectations and growing the resource pool. Um, but until we really get that pool built up, we will have to learn how to make hard choices and how to prioritize things. So the, what could that look like? What kinds of things could that do? It might mean signing up every six weeks or so to be a greeter or being willing if we bring back coffee to make the coffee or wash the cups, right? Um, we're gonna start practicing this morning, going to habit we used to have of clearing the chairs to the side at the end of platform, right? Um, there are any number of very pragmatic tasks that could be done um, easily without a lot of planning, pre-planning or advanced time commitment. And there are much more complex tasks that of course require our thought and our energy and our collaboration. Felix Adler said, ethical religion can be real only to those who are engaged in ceaseless efforts at moral improvement. By moving upward, we acquire faith in an upward movement without limit. So the life of our community is fluid. It is ever changing with new lives, new visions, new possibilities, new paths. People come, people go, um, but there is an abiding interest in being in community together and of making the world a better place. And so 
everyone has a role to play in creating the vibrant West that we desire. And so our future is what we make it. <laughs>